Hello everybody, I think if you can please take your seats, we're about to start a very riveting, interesting panel with speakers literally from all corners of the world, uh, with very, very diverse and interesting examples of how we connect the dots between nature, nature-based solutions, and water, uh, all aspects of water management on the ground with um, a little bit of a deep dive um, of interesting examples of what works, what doesn't work, and recommendations for going forward. So um, I'm delighted to um, welcome my panelists, and I'll do so now. Before I do, I would just like to say that uh, people can, are welcome to come in and take their seats, um, even move closer if you want to. We do want to allow for engagement from the floor as well at the end of the session. That's what it's all about, is engaging. And um, um, you will have the chance to do so um, at the, towards the end. Um, so I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Kirby Brandt. I'm the Deputy Secretary General of uh, ICLI. You've heard the name yesterday. Uh, we are um, the oldest and largest network of cities and subnational governments committed to sustainability. Uh, we're 30 plus years old and we have, um, we work with uh, about 4,500 cities and other subnational governments, large and small, from around the world. Um, on all aspects related to the SDGs, um, particularly in the field of climate, uh, biodiversity, circularity, waste management, water management, sanitation, urban planning, design, etc. Um, so for us, it's a real pleasure to work with our very, very close partners, UN Habitat, and let me also take the opportunity to congratulate and thank UN Habitat for uh, convening us as the GWOPA Fifth Congress here. It's a real privilege for us to be here in person. Uh, it makes all the difference for us to be in person once again. Uh, so this session is entitled um, uh, it, and uh, b by the way, let me just say the session is also streaming online. So to those who are joining us online, a very warm welcome to you. We know everybody couldn't travel to Bonn to be with us. We are um, very, very pleased that you're joining us. And yes, uh, you are welcome to participate in this session. Um, there are, for those in the room, there are the headsets and there are the different language, four different language options, of course, available. So this session's, session is entitled Grounding Nature's Based Solutions, NBS, and Water Resource Protection. And uh, we would like to thank our conveners, UN Habitat and others, for putting together such a fantastic and diverse group of speakers here for us today. Um, the session is a collaboration between a number of partners, including the Costa Rican Institute of Aqueducts and Sewers, Water and Sanitation Company of Bogota, ICLI, ourselves, Local Governments for Sustainability, the International Water Association, IWA, and the Nature Conserv Conservancy, TNC. Historically, cities and their utilities have relied on human-engineered infrastructure to manage their water, such as water and wastewater treatment plants, pipelines, pump stations, and reservoirs. We also refer to this infrastructure as grey infrastructure, historically. However, with our growing populations and e economies coupled with the impacts of climate change across the globe, this traditional grey infrastructure is no longer sufficient or able to address our current challenges. There are better solutions out there. This is where the utilities and cities have turned to nature-based solutions, uh, amongst others, to complement the grey infrastructure and, more importantly, to help us improve existing water management in and around our cities. Nature-based solutions can address water security needs while sustainability managing, sustainably managing our natural resources, restoring biodiversity and helping us cope with climate change. Incorporating NBS into cities is an efficient way to complement the traditional grey infrastructure by protecting our water resources, avoiding damages caused by extreme events 
optimizing the design or delaying the needs for major capital expenditure while reducing related operational and maintenance costs. One example of mainstreaming biodiversity as a catalyst for revitalizing the ecosystem and urban areas can only be successful when we include human vulnerability in the development agenda. Human rights approaches are coming more and more to the fore. Thus, the transdisciplinary approach of both um, projects run by ECLIM partners called Interact Bio and Urban Natural Assets, or UNA for short, has proven particularly important uh, uh, given uh, increasing recognition of the interconnectedness between social and ecological systems, highlighting benefits that ecosystems and ecological infrastructure provide to society specifically set against the global targets aimed at conserving and protecting our natural resources and adopted specifically in the new Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which was adopted at the CBD COP15 in Montreal at the end of last year. Other examples of NBS are, uh, for instance, reforestation, wetland restoration, natural treatment technologies, and sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, so jumping into today's session, we have four contributions that will show, showcase uh, to, to us grounded examples of various parts of the life cycle of projects, starting at the design phase, moving to financing, implementi implementation of projects, and finally monitoring and evaluation of projects. Without further ado, uh, we're going to go through our four speakers who have presentations and who will discuss with us these real-life examples, and then we will open the floor for engagement from you to them. The two people that are, gentle, uh, that are joining us online, the two gentlemen have agreed to stay online for the duration, so you can also address questions to them in that open part of the agenda. So my first... Um, uh, a guest of honor today with us is Alejandro uh, Ivankovic, and he is the Rural Wastewater Systems Engineer at the Costa Rican Institute of Aqueducts and Sewers. He has experience um, in both rural drinking water and wastewater system management for many years, and he is here uh, to give us virtually his input, um, and he's, he's going to talk to us about the use of multi-soil layering system, that very specific multi-soil -layer, layering system that was designed for wastewater treatment in Costa Rica as a rural initiative. So, Alejandro, welcome, and without further ado, I'm giving you the floor. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for that introduction. For this nature-based solution example, I have the, um, the process of design for a wastewater system in Costa Rica using a multi-soil layering system. Uh, excuse me, I don't know if I can go through the presentation. Can we get that one up, please? Uh, I don't know how to go through the presentation. Karis, uh, you just want to check if we have a, a, an option? I think you have to say next That's slide, and then the people in the room will... Maybe I have to do it from here, I'm not sure, because let me see what happens if I click. Ah, I think oh, I can okay. take you through it. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can take you through it. Just sign to me when you need me to move on. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, then I work for Instituto Costarricense de Acueductos y Alcantarillados, better known as AIA. 
and we are working on this design for a wastewater rural system in Costa Rica. Next slide, please. So for the problem statement, uh, we can see the next slide. We have uh, the Costa Rican map here, and we have this community called Los Cenizaros. It is a rural community, and it is located south of the urban area. And this community has community operated also water and wastewater systems. Uh, so they manage their own water. And we are focusing here in the red circle in the wastewater treatment plant that's near the river. And uh, you can see a photo there of that plant. Next, please. This wastewater treatment plant can be best described by this diagram. We have the influence of raw water. It passes through a pretreatment, including bar screening, grid channel, and a grid strap, and then goes to an upflow anaerobic reactor, or UASB, and then that effluent is discharged into the river. We also have a sludge digester and drying beds for that sludge and this treats wastewater for 700 people approximately. So the problem currently is that it, this effluent doesn't comply with Costa Rican regulation with the quality limits for discharge. And this is because the UASB is poorly operated, but we also think that this system is lacking um, another treatment process or a secondary treatment in order to comply with the regulations. So this community asked AIA for help in order to come up with a solution for this effluent. Next slide, please. So um, I did a little research, searching for something that will be useful for this community. And I found this multi-soil layering or MSL system we can see in the next slide. So the, this is a Japanese technology and its characteristics are that it is made with local materials from rural communities. It has low cost of implementation and uses less area than lagoons or constructed wetlands. And it has a really easy operation and maintenance it also offers removal of BOD, COD, suspended solids, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and requires a primary treatment before. So you can see the, the diagram here, and it is pretty much like a trickling filter. So the water comes from the upper side, the influent, and it goes dripping through these layers. We have a permeable layer, that's the clear part, and we also have soil mixture blocks or soil blocks. And they're like in a brick-like pattern. And this pattern helps prevent clogging in the system. Then we have uh, the collection of the effluent at the bottom. Next slide, please. And these soil blocks are made up of soil activated carbon, or it could be normal carbon also. Organic matter, whichever the community has, like waste, organic matter, sawdust, or maybe from rice or something they, they grow there. And we also have iron scraps for the soil blocks. And for permeable layers, we could use gravel or volcanic rock or zeolite. I used anthracite that's waste anthracite from a drinking water treatment plant. And well, you, you could have aeration, but that's optional. Next slide, please. We can see a diagram here of the processes that take place in this system because the soil mixture blocks or soil blocks become saturated with water, they become anaerobic. And then we have the permeable layers that have aerobic conditions and anoxic conditions between them. So 
the wastewater comes in with its contaminants and we have different processes that decontaminate the water. We have nitrification in the aerobic zone and then denitrification in the anaerobic zone, removing nitrogen. For the solids and BOD, COD, we have filtration, adsorption, biodegradation, because the soil is a complex material and permits these processes. And we have ion exchange that removes nitrogen and some other ion exchange and oxidation with precipitation that removes phosphorus. So we have a lot of different aerobic and anaerobic processes in the same system. Next slide, please. So our design proposal, and we can see this is the, the original one. And the next one, please. We want to add an MSL system after the UASB and then discharge to the river. But because the MSL system is so new for Costa Rica and for this community, we wanted to make sure it's a good option and it would work because some people didn't think it would work. So we wanted to run a pilot study. Uh, next slide, please. So I designed four pilots some of them with anthracite for permeable material and some of them with gravel and some of them with sandy soil and some of them with silty soil with a total of eight permeable layers and seven soil blocks each. You can see the diagram for the design and it is 80 centimeters tall in total. You can see some of the process. It is a very simple process for getting the materials, for drying and mixing them. Everything can be obtained in the community. Next, please. Then we took everything to the site, to the wastewater treatment plant. Next one, please. And then I build um, the pilots. You can see on the top left corner um, the under drain and then a layer of permeable material, then a layer of soil blocks, then you could use another layer of permeable material, then another layer of soil blocks and so on until you reach the 80 centimeters in this case. And we have here the final result for the four pilots and you can see the pipe coming from the UASB and distributing to the four pilots. Also in the next uh, slide, we can see videos from the influent and the effluent of one of the pilots. You can see there the, the trickling process. That's the effluent. And then I think you can see there the the influent that's just dripping there. Oh, there it is. So this is how it works. And we had results for this study. Next, please. Mm -hmm. We measured on site, on laboratory, a lot of different parameters. I'm not showing all of them today, but we measured flow, temperature, pH, BOD, COD, suspended solids, nitrogen, phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, total solids, total dissolved solids, turbidity, and color. I will show some of them here. You can see the COD results. The black line is the influent for the pilots. And then the, um, the color bars are the effluent for each pilot. And you will see throughout these results and the other ones that P1 and P3, those are the anthracite ones, have better results for every parameter. You can also see that everything here is below the 150 milligrams per liter for COD and 50 milligrams per liter for BOD. Those are Costa Rican regulations for this effluent. So we have best results for P1 and P3, but still everything is beneath those levels. Then 
similar for TSS. We have the influent and better results for P1 and P3, but still everything below the 50 milligrams per liter limit. That's what Costa Rican regulation says. And then uh, Costa Rica doesn't have, or still doesn't have a regulation for phosphorus or for nitrogen, but still we can see here, and we wanted to show that the system can remove phosphorus, especially uh, pilot one, but also pilot three and a little bit for pilot two and four. And I don't know which the regulation would be for Costa Rica, but we have removal of, of phosphorus. And for nitrogen, I wanted to show this um, this example, just one of the dates, but because I wanted to show that components of the total nitrogen. We have nitrite in yellow, nitrate in gray, organic nitrogen in orange, and ammoniacal nitrogen in blue. And we see the inlet at the left and the effluent of the pilots at the right. We have removal of nitrogen because there is nitrification and denitrification. Better nitrification for P1 and P3, but still some nitrification for P2 and P4. And then the denitrification is the limiting process because if we could have more denitrification, there will be more removal. But we learned that as the system gets more mature, it denitrificates better. So we could expect better removal along the time. So for conclusions, the effluent from the four pilots complied with the limits established in the Costa Rican regulation. And the anthracite pilots show better removal efficiency, but the gravel ones still comply with the, the limits. And the ease of acquisition of the materials and the low cost of implementations, the simplicity of the operation and the construction of this system make MSL filters suitable to be implemented for this design and probably for other designs and other Costa Rican and Latin American rural countries. And the next steps, well, we have the preliminary designs completed, not the pilot ones, but the, the full ones, but the final design is in process. And the good news is this communal organization won a contest that will give them the necessary funds for the implementation of this system and probably to comply with the Costa Rican limits. And it's a great opportunity for other communities to see and get involved with nature-based solutions that are what really are suitable for them, not just use the same solutions all over again in communities that not necessarily have the means to, to deal with them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, what, a, what a quick deep dive, a really sophisticated study underway, but low tech does work. And my question to you was going to be how replicable is this? And can it be used in other countries? You sort of alluded to that it can be, um, but maybe we can look into that a little bit more later in, uh, later in this session. I'm going to thank you very much for this really interesting uh, case study and, and study that you shared with us. Move to our next speaker. Um, and now we're moving to a very large organization, the Nature Conservancy, specifically Rob Cunningham, who is um, the Resilient Watershed Program Director for Europe at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Rob has a background in water quality and water resource management and has worked for NGOs, regulators and utilities, always maintaining a focus on how nature-based solutions can be deployed for the benefit of people and biodiversity. So Rob, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to come up here and share with us your presentation. You can speak into uh, this microphone because then the speakers who are online can also hear you. I've got the instructions. Okay, so yes, um, hello everyone. So um, I'm gonna run through water funds and their application in Norfolk. Um, first question, what is, a, what is a water fund? Well, quite simply, it's a kind of mechanism for organizing investment 
from downstream users and beneficiaries of uh, water resources, um, kind of focusing investment and, and um, uh, into uh, upstream communities and land managers, so you into nature-based solutions and land managements for the benefits of those downstream. It's a kind of well and tried and tested um, approach. So the Nature Conservancy, we've been working across uh, 43 water funds uh, in 13 countries, and you can see um, there's England uh, up there, little old England, and um, the key steps to creating a water fund, um, we're kind of going through that in this session, but like feasibility, design, um, these are really, to me, the feasibility is a really key step um, because the big learning that, that I'll be going through is, um, you know, fundamentally for a nature-based solutions uh, approach, for a water fund approach, you've got to have some, you've got to have a, a water security issue you can address through nature-based solutions. You've got to have willing uh, purchasers of those nature-based solutions of those water services. And also, crucially, you've got to have land managers and communities who are willing and able to deliver those nature-based solutions. Um, a little bit about Norfolk, um, where I grew up. Uh, so it's a very rural, sleepy part of England on the East Coast. Um, it's kind of known for um, its agriculture. It's very low-lying. Uh, you'll struggle to get more than 100 metres above sea level anywhere in the county. Um, and it's, um, it's dry, but it's also noted for its wetland uh, and river wildlife. And it's dominated by chalk through a kind of central belt. And chalk rivers are really a very special habitat. Um, there's about 200 chalk rivers in the world, and the UK has about 80% of those. So, so Norfolk has a really kind of specific and special kind of relationship to chalk rivers. And this is a couple of examples of rivers. In the top right there, you've got... Um, the Great Ouse, which was originally kind of modified by the Romans and finished off by the Dutch. And um, so it's a very heavily modified landscape. And the bottom left is a really dynamic, the River Nar. It's a tiny little chalk stream, really important for brown trout, um, native species, a really kind of adapted ecosystem. But that's a kind of range of, of habitats we're talking about in Norfolk. Um, the Norfolk Water Strategy, so the Norfolk Water Fund isn't being delivered by the Nature Conservancy, it's, Conservancy. it's being delivered by the Norfolk Water Strategy Program, and that's a partnership between ourselves, the water company, the local government, and Water Resources East, which is a kind of multi-sector water resource management platform. So, we, so it starts from a place of collaboration. One of the first things uh, the, the strategy did was um, a, a kind of literature view, review and technical review of the water security issues in Norfolk, and through stakeholder engagement, identified that water quality and water resources were the two main aspects that nature-based solutions would be useful to address. Um, in terms of the water resources uh, challenge, uh, is Norfolk has a famously low rainfall, 650 to 750 millimetres of rain per year. So if you think of England as a wet, dull, grey country, um, at least it's, it's grey and dull, but it's dry in Norfolk. Um, it's... Um, it's it's, it's quite densely, it, it, although it's agricultural, there's very high population growth, and so water resources are under quite a lot of stress. There's a lot of water withdrawal for public water supply and agriculture. Um, it's very stressed by climate change, so the southeast of England will be hit hardest and quickest by climate change. Um, and because of the, the sensitivity of the habitats, there's increased focus on um, reducing abstraction or water withdrawal, so actually regulators are, are tightening the limits uh, the allowances for farmers and for public water supply. So around the opportunities for a fund, um, we've, got, uh, we've got the kind of water av availability to those abstractors, to those people who rely on water resources. Um, supply chain resilience, so we're looking at kind of agricultural production and how do we maintain that into the future. And also environmental protection, because there is a lot of investment from government and others in environmental protection in that part of the world. From a water quality perspective, so the, this map here, is the orange uh, denotes agricult uh, arable agriculture. So it's, as you can see, it does dominate the land use. Um, there's quite a lot of diffuse pollution from arable agriculture. Really interesting, the previous presentation about kind of small communities. Actually, although we have a very well-developed um, centralized network of sewage treatment works across the county, there's an awful lot of people on um, their own domestic septic tanks and private package treatment plants or similar issues. It's about three or 4,000 uh, houses that aren't connected to the main sewer, so lots of diffuse pollution. Point source continues to be a problem, and we have really, really sensitive habitats. 
Uh, we've got the tightest water quality standards anywhere in the country uh, applied to our rivers and our wetlands. And so when we're looking at opportunities, one of the key things, that, that sensitivity of those habitats has driven this concept of nutrient neutrality. At the moment, in, in the majority of Norfolk, they, you cannot build a house until you can prove that it will not have uh, any negative impact, any uplift in nutrient quality. So actually, it doesn't, you don't have to prove there won't be an impact on the river. You just have to prove that not a gram of extra phosphorus or nitrogen will be emitted to the environment. And we're right up against technical, uh, technological limits in terms of what the sewage treatment works can deliver. So we're looking at, so people are looking at innovation through nature-based solutions and through, um, through grey infrastructure. Um, and there's also a lot of <coughs> water company interest in, uh, in future uh, water quality standards. So in terms of opportunities, I won't go into the details. We've, we've had a lot of modelling done in partnership with the, uh, with the regulator. And what that's kind of shown is actually on the chalk, there's a lot of opportunity for infiltration. So that through better soil management, because a lot of that arable agriculture is damaging the soils, making it a, lo a lot less pervious. So a lot less rainfall actually makes it to the groundwater. Uh, and also creating what are called runoff attenuation features, essentially ponds in the landscape that infiltrate water. So rural suds is another term that's quite often used. And um, the modelling suggests you get something like a 5 to 12% increase in low flows. It could be really significant, but it would require an awful lot of land use change. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, nutrient neutrality or nutrients more generally, um, really high demand. On here, the kind of grey dots, greyish dots are the areas of growth and the darker red is the demand for nutrient rid offsets and uh, really significant um, nutrient offsets and we're looking at habitat creation, uh, buffer strips to um, uh, treatment wetlands both on the back of small sewage treatment works but also actually um, on some of the more polluted small tributaries and septic tanks, moving septic tanks to nature-based solutions and now I have another thing to look at in terms of these multi-layer soil uh, systems. Perhaps that would also be something we could, uh, we could implement. So we've been kind of looking at, uh, you know, so, so that's kind of, yes, there are issues. Yes, nature-based solutions can, can, can um, address, help address them. What about the demand? So we think nutrient neutrality is going to be worth 12 to 24 million pounds a year in that, in that uh, catchment. We know the water company is going to be spending in excess of £5 million pounds a year on wastewater upgrades. Um, and we also know um, that the, the government is... is um, uh, uh, sorry, that there's also um, supply chain issues and, um, and wider kind of company interest in, in uh, environmental sustainability. Um, but we haven't really factored that in, uh, or we haven't been able to quantify that as yet. But the other thing we're looking at in Norfolk is, is what are the other sources of funds? What are the co-benefits? How do we actually layer in other sources of investment that are existing? So this remains a significant amount of government funding around biodiversity improvements to uh, agricultural support, uh, flood risk management, in growing interest in nature-based solutions around flood risk. Um, biodiversity net gain, not only do developers in Norfolk have to prove they're not emitting any more nutrients, they also have to offset any biodiversity damage. So actually, um, there's a whole system about to start in the UK and in Norfolk uh, around creating offsets. So can we layer bio, uh, biodiversity net gain, habitat creation against um, income from that, against income that you might accrue in terms of the nutrient benefits for that as well? And everyone's interested in carbon, but we haven't really delved into that. It's a, it's a murky world. Um, so, 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 yeah, there's, there's money. In fact, uh, money's not the issue in Norfolk. I think uh, this is one of the really key bits of learning, actually, is the supply side. So will farmers engage? Will we get land managers to take, uh, implement nature-based solutions on their land? And what you've got to remember in the dynamics, the power dynamics in Norfolk, we're talking about some of the wealthiest landowners in Europe, some productive, highly productive um, land, people with a lot to lose. And so there's a lot of concern about risk, there's a lot of concern about putting money up front into an investment that may or may not pay off because they have no experience in that. So we're looking to address those financial <coughs> barriers. And then there's a lot of informational barriers because we're entering to new types of contracts, contracts that could last 30 to 100 years. A lot of lack of information, you know, lack of understanding about what a nature-based solution is and how could it or, uh, fit into a farming system or might it conflict with farming systems. And really can't... Un um, 
really can't kind of overplay how important these supply side issues are in the Norfolk context. So in terms of the financial barriers, what we're looking to do is um, create a work with some impact investors and they might be with uh, philanthropic impact investors, it might be local government desperate to unlock housing and economic growth in the region, to actually put that upfront money in and take the risk, take the risk of failure out of the hands of the farmers and the landowners. So, um, so essentially we're working through that and you know, that's looking quite hopeful. I'm very confident we will have, a, we will have a, um, a fund which will be able to offer money for feasibility and possibly capital delivery that's repayable upon the delivery of a, of a marketable nutrient credit or a water credit or a biodiversity credit. And so that de-risks it for the landowners. Uh, and also, um, but actually a lot more effort's been going into the informational barriers. We've got a brilliant pilot in the heart of, um, in the heart of Norfolk called uh, Wendling Beck, and you can see our lovely farmers, uh, Rosie uh, and Glenn. They're not married, they'd like me to say that, I'm sure. But, um, you know, there's four farmers working across 2,000 um, acres and implementing nature-based solutions and learning lessons, working with lawyers, working with financial modelers. How does this work in the context of their farm business? And then taking that learning and putting it into an information hub, making that shareable, doing outreach, um, and being, um, you know, really kind of grounding what we're saying to other landowners in the context of real lived experience in Norfolk. So where are we now? Well, we're pretty much through feasibility and design. Um, we're, we're pretty close to the final design, creation of the actual fund and launching in September is the target. And in terms of operation, we're already delivering stuff through pilots. So I would say we are already kind of generating uh, marketable credits, but we're doing that through a pilot. And it's gonna be a couple of, two to five years, I'm sure, before we get to maturity. And one of the key bits of learning is, for me, is that actually the path between these stages, it's not linear, and we're going up and down this, you know, some days we think we're just about there on the operational side of things, and then we get knocked back because of political changes or lo local or national policy. Um, but fundamentally, because of that feasibility and because we've done the, the, the work around the design, we're absolutely confident there is an economic uh, and environmental case for the fund, and uh, it's really a matter of time um, rather than anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just stay there for a second, if I may ask. Um, I think we all know about the Nature Conservancy's um, leap of faith into these water funds all over the world, and really hats off, because I think we all know how important it is to find new financial solutions and opportunities for utilities, for local governments, etc. And what we see here is also that you're going... You say it's non-linear, um, and it's not something that one can achieve in a year or two's time. You know, it takes a lot of commitment, many years, to working with many stakeholders, etc. And um, I think my question to you is just a little to reflect on: Do you think um, this sort of fund, when, when it is established, it will sustain itself? And do you think it will also be? or has the potential to be a catalyst for further nature-based solutions in the area and in surrounding areas? Um, can it become something more um, than just a water fund? Could it also catalyze other projects as well? And any, any key takeouts for us who want to unlock financial funding opportunities for, for local governments for this sort of thing? Yeah, those aren't those aren't easy questions to answer. So I think I think the lived experience um, globally around water funds is that there is quite often a very long transition period where support from government, um, uh, development agencies, etc., is really critical to get them over the line. But absolutely, the the model is, uh, and the desire is to get to move to um, self sufficiency. I think it really depends on the kind of social and economic circumstance you're working in. Norfolk is not, a, or the UK is not a poor country. There's absolutely no reason why the fund can't be self-financing. It's just a matter of developing the policies and the, the appetite for doing that. And I, I definitely see that. And, and England's a really, uh, there's a really dynamic kind of national policy debate around how you create 
private investment in nature conservation. So there's, there's probably 40 or 50 projects that are on this journey around, around England. So yeah, I, I'm absolutely convinced it's got, it's got space to scale and we'll all take bits of learning from each other and what we end up with will be a hybrid of all of that learning. Thank you very much to Rob. Let's give him a big round of applause. Brave work, but that's what the world calls for now. Urgency and brave, brave, bravery, and um, also um, seeing a project through. So well done and good luck. And uh, let's keep ourselves posted and keep an eye on what happens in Norfolk in the years ahead. Now we're going to our next guest who's also joining us online and you can, I can see him. Ah, oh, there we, there, we all can see you. Um, you. Great, uh, Jeff Tooley. Jeff is from my country, South Africa, other part of my country. I'm from Cape Town. Jeff is from Itzekweni, which is on the other coastline. But we're big friends. And um, I would like to introduce Jeff to you. Um, he's, he's our next speaker, um, Senior Manager, Catchment Management at the Itzekweni Municipality. Many will know uh, it as Durban, uh, who is joining us virtually. And um, Jeff is going to talk to us about transformative river, river management, not only in Etiquini, but in South Africa as well. And Jeff, um, please uh, take the floor. You have a presentation and I'm going to help you go through the slides, but please take the floor and welcome. We, we, we are very happy that you're joining us online. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Ikli, for inviting me to speak here. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to address you all. Um, Chair, I was told that I would share from this side because I'm having a few challenges that the screen, the room plenary screen is not changing on my side. I see it's up on the, on the board. Am I able to, from the technical side, am I able to share? Uh, press the forward button and let's see what happens. Doesn't look okay. like it, Jeff. You're in my hands, but I'll press okay, the buttons well, on your demand. It's fine. Let, what I'll do is I'll open the presentation on my side, and then I'll just tell you when I'm moving on to the next slide. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you again, everyone. Um, I'm going to just talk to you a bit about this trans the Transformative River Management Program uh, business case and, and the work we've done in Durban. And it's really looking at how we maintain natural assets to increase the city resilience. I understand that this uh, conference is looking at water and, and sanitation aspects, and um, most of our sewers are gravity sewers within, within Durban. Um, and um, moving on to the next slide, in terms of the municipal co context, you can see where we're situated right on the eastern coast of, the, of, the so of Southern Africa. And there's some information for you to go through there. The main thing there is that we've got 7,400 kilometers of, of rivers and streams, um, and that's a substantial amount um, when you start looking at that in the urban context. Um, we have 18 river catchment and 17 different uh, estuaries that are impacted by these river, river catchments. Next slide. So the Durban climate future, we, we're looking at higher temperatures. We're looking at generally wetter and more variable rainfall. Um, and an increased storm intensity. So it, it's not good news from a point of view of our infrastructure and assets and the urban context around those streams and rivers. So we're looking at increased flooding and reduced water quality because of damage to sewers, uh, that those gravity sewers that, that follow those river systems. So the challenge that we're facing within our city is, is twofold, um, that, that, and this is where we started, and it, we realized it was alien vegetation and solid waste. For my, on my part, primarily looking at uh, river crossings, so these are road crossings, and the road crossings obviously carry uh, services across uh, these streams, and we started noticing a lot of more blockages uh, and a lot more overtopping and the associated flooding of adjacent properties um, and uh, the impact on the services that crossed in those rivers. So the question we asked ourselves is how do we start bringing this in in the light of the climate change that we were going to see if we move to the next slide? 
Um, just to confirm, we're on the, uh, the summary of the problem. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, so what we saw with the alien vegetation is we originally, everyone said, oh, the, the reason for the blockages is the solid waste. Um, and that forms a large part of it. But what we realized is that about 70% of the blockage material is the actual alien vegetation that is um, getting pulled out during uh, uh, flood uh, scenarios. The alien vegetation, it grows faster. It has a shallow root system that crowds out uh, the slower growing, deep rooted indigenous plants. The alien vegetation, um, it's easily pulled out during, during floods and we end up with this clump of material going uh, downstream towards the culverts. Uh, in our case, a lot of it is the Spanish reed, and they, it grows to about three meters high, uh, but as I said, a shallow root system. What happens though, when this gets pulled out of the river bank, we've now got uh, more of our river banks exposed, so therefore, therefore it's uh, more easily erodible, and that results in greater volumes of silt uh, traveling downstream when the culverts block and the water is uh, slowed down, the silt drops out, which raises the, the bed of the stream, increasing flood risk. The larger trees that uh, are along the embankments, they often are undermined um, and they form part of that flotsam that goes down and, and blocks the, the culverts. And then we have sewers and infrastructure that run along our rivers, and these are more easily undermined. Uh, resulting in not only damage to these infrastructure, but in the case of sewerage, we end up, the sewers, we end up with that sewerage after a flood event, uh, literally pouring out of the pipes into, into the rivers. And the associated uh, pollution of that within the river system and then out into our coastline and onto our beaches. And being a tourist city, this is a, a large negative impact on our economy as well. The alien vegetation and the trees, they form the primary blockage, and I'll show you some pictures just now, which collects all the solid waste in the flow. Um, and most of the solid wa waste, interesting enough, would travel through these culverts without calling, causing a blockage. So the alien vegetation is, is, is that real problem for us in terms of the damage to our infrastructure. And that blockage causes overtopping and uh, the associated damage to, to, to that uh, service infrastructure. Next slide. So just some, some of the maths in terms of what uh, the relationship between the opening and uh, the flow that can get uh, through. And, and I, I bring this in because it's important to understand that a little bit of blockage can create a lot of damage. So if we have a 40% blockage, so if only 60% of, of the culvert opening is available, the water has to double its height to get the same amount of flow through that culvert. And so what that results in is it, it results in more of our culverts overtopping earlier and therefore more time for that uh, culvert to be, to be eroded. And um, so, so going on to the next slide, we recognized this as far back as 2009 and as part of our the municipal adaptation plans, which were part of the, the, the start of our, the Durban's climate strategy, we identified that we need to look at ways of protecting and restoring the riparian vegetation so that we can protect the integrity of the river banks and maintain those buffers against uh, flooding. And it was through this program through this, uh, putting it onto the municipal adaptation plans that we then got support from the management and the politicians to then start investigating how do we bring this into the work of the city. And out of that, going on to the next slide, um, came the Sichland Zimvelo program. We realized we had eight different departments going to the same streams. The uh, stormwater department looking at erosion and flooding issues, the parks looking at vegetation control, environment looking at alien vegetation, pollution control, sanitation department, the environmental health people, vector control, as well as our roads and stormwater maintenance teams. And a question we started looking at is how could we look at a different way of doing things within our catchments that would maximize the effort that we're putting in here? We've, our city has grown in terms of land area, but budgets and staff have not grown. 
and so we started seeing a, 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 a lot of these streams were being neg neglected and out of it came the sessions and velo program we have a lot of unemployment as you saw in the first slide it's about 35 percent probably a little bit more at the moment um, and we have a lot of these communities that um, are living close to the streams and so the way it works is that we work with the communities, we help them develop co-ops, um, and then those co-ops have to put in through a uh, expression of interest contract. They apply to the city once they're registered. Uh, we then identify, have identified streams. We looked at firstly at what budget we had, um, and we started off with about 26 million rand a year. And um, at the initial part of the project, we started seeing a lot of benefits because you can see some of those pictures before, a lot of alien vegetation, a lot of solid waste. And then the pictures below, these are urban streams where you could literally go and have a picnic on. And so what the co-op is given is they're given five kilometers of stream to look, look after. They have to take out the alien vegetation as well as the solid waste, three meters either side of the actual water itself and, in, and inside the water. They are the, the, we have assessors that are also employed out of the community and these have to take pictures on a monthly basis at uh, GPS points um, and these are uploaded into the web so that there's a track record of what the streams look like and the co-ops are paid on the basis of how well that area is maintained. So if they maintain it according to the standard, they get 100% of their payment if it's not up to 100%, then there's different uh, characteristics that are assessed. So it's really a, re a results-driven payment. What they also do, because these culverts, the, these people, these co-ops are on the uh, streams on a daily basis, they report sewer leaks. And uh, we've also seen where this, the alien vegetation is being removed. We've seen communities starting to grow vegetable gardens. Next slide, please. So what we started seeing was the benefits coming out of this. And there's four main areas was job creation and business creation. So suddenly we've got these co-ops that are now being upskilled in, in business management. So it's not just employing people. We're employing the co-op. And we've seen a number of these co-ops branch into other businesses. Uh, they're working closer to home, so they're not spending a lot of money on transport. And we're also seeing more money in the local economy, which is obviously stimulating other businesses uh, with, within those areas. Next slide, please. The second one is the presence on the stream. Um, what we're seeing here is an early and accurate reporting of sewer leaks or blockages. So now before we used to get reports, now there's sewage in the river and it used to take the sewer teams six weeks sometimes to try and go up through the stream to find where the manhole surcharging or the pipe is broken. But now we're getting accurate reporting. And so the maintenance teams are spending their time fixing the breaks or the blockages rather than spending their time finding it. That's resulted in improved water quality. Um, and obviously there's all the other benefits come, that come with that. We've got reporting of other wrongdoing that is happening within that area and, and reduced criminal activity. So we're starting to see communities see this place as a place of, of value and because they're feeling safer in that area. A lot of this, the Spanish reed being removed, the criminals don't have a place to hide. As well as a community awareness, there, there's a sense of ownership that's coming through this where it's seen as a place of value now as, a, as rather as a place of waste as it was before. Next slide, please. The, fourth, the third one is the removal of alien vegetation. We're seeing uh, reduced erosion potential. We're seeing areas cleared for veggie gardens, uh, safer areas. We're also seeing uh, recycling opportunities come up, composting, building materials of, as these alien vegetation is, are removed from these uh, streams. And obviously there's a the reduced blockage of the crossings. And then the final one, moving on to the next slide, the removal of solid waste. Um, has similar benefits uh, in terms of reduced pollution. We're also seeing less vectors, so less rats. Because there's less waste going in, we're seeing less uh, rats in this area, so therefore less um, uh, illnesses from, from those vectors. And then also more recycling opportunities, so that, uh, that paver you see there is about 70% of the solid, the dirty plastics that are coming out of the stream, as well as broken glass and, and soil. So 
So the question that we had is how do we upscale? We started to see all these benefits. Moving on to the next slide, how do we see the, these benefits? And you can see the, the city, the colored areas are where we are working at the moment. And, and the question was how do we upscale this to 7,400 kilometers and, and realize the benefits across our whole city? And that's where we are fortunate to come across the C40 Cities Finance Facility. And they funded us in terms of developing a business case uh, and, and, a, and a benefit cost uh, analysis for this. So it really was looking at how do we build a compelling business case that, that is resilient to climate change, so we're making up our city, that these become valuable places that are clean, safe, healthy, useful, and pleasant open spaces, that we close the loops in terms of the blue economy linked to recycling, et cetera. We create jobs and build a green economy that's addressing, obviously, the um, unemployment within these areas um, to build communities, um, build skills, build uh, knowledge of, of the space that these people that live in and taking ownership and, and building community structures. Work in partnership with um, all affected so stakeholders, and then obviously impact positively on the city as a whole. So the challenge that we had is there's, uh, we've got the land ownerships. We can only spend city funding on council-owned land, but we have 26% that is privately owned and 51% that is in traditional authority. And this resulted in when we started looking at that is how do we develop an implementation plan and we looked at the existing program that we had how do we upscale that and and that already has resulted in us upscaling from from a, about 300 kilometers we're now doing over 500 kilometers and that's with city budget and we're busy engaging with the private sector as well as the ingiyama trust land in terms of developing models within those areas so that we can implement across the city as a whole so moving on to the actual results of the cost benefits slide. Um, so we're now in the case for the upscaling of um, the Shisan Velo and municipal land. We, we only had the, the, the data related to damage to municipal culvert and roads crossings. We didn't have the data related to, uh, were we confident in the sewer damage and water main damage, et cetera. So we've worked just on, on the numbers that we did have. And um, what we've, what's co we've come out of is that we're looking at about, if we could work on the city-owned land, we would see an avoided cost of about 50 million rand per annum on the road crossings and, and uh, culvert damage. We're seeing linked to that would be 177 million rand in societal benefits each year. We would create 1,557 jobs through 300, 234 cooperatives. And what's not included in there is the additional green economy opportunities. So that would be looking at about 92 million rand annual cost to the municipality. At the moment, it's about 46 million rand. So we're, we're sitting at just over 500 kilometers and the CFO is really excited about these numbers coming out and has asked us for a business case as to how we expand the resources to make this happen. So for every one rand we spend, we are seeing a two rand 60 benefit in municipal and society benefits. And I must stress that's excluding the damage to sewers and water mains. So once we add that in, we, we know this number is going to grow. If we expand this now to the next slide and, and we look at the whole city, for every one rand spent, we are estimating that between one rand 80 and, and three rand 40 in municipal and societal benefits. <clears throat> in excess of 9,000 jobs, and I stress again, this is only looking at damage to municipal culverts and road crossings. And it excludes the additional green economy opportunities. So the next slide, this is just highlighting, this is not just about the city doing it. The case of the Ella River was led by an NGO. There was some government funding, but also some private funding that went into this. And out of this program came the idea of the eco champs. These are community members that actually are employed to engage with their communities. And quite interesting, one of the things that came out of this program is that um, we have a major problem with uh, disposable napkins being thrown in the sewer system and into the rivers. And one of the eco champs linked this to how fish can eat it and how the community loves eating fish. 
and just through that simple connection was able to start making a difference within those communities and we're seeing far less of that pollution happening in the areas that be, have been engaged. There's also the case of the Durban Green Corridors. This was a Section 67 company that was set up by the city, so with city funding. Um, but the benefit of this is that through that initiative, they've been able to leverage private funding to actually multiply the impact of the work that they're doing. And that's working within some of the larger river systems in terms of waste removal and alien plant removal. So in terms of transformative river governance, it's important that we recognize that there are three aspects. We need the social invest uh, interventions, we need the river run system re restoration and management, and we need those green economy interventions if we're gonna make this work as a fully transformative uh, river management program. So moving on to the next slide, there's four types of funding needs. You need program management. It's important that you, we, there's the coordination that happens between uh, the different uh, role players, that there's program design, the cost benefit analysis, which starts to talk to the needs of funders to understand the return on investment here. We need river on infrastructure. So we've spoken about the gray infrastructure, but also looking after the ecological infrastructure, replacing those re uh, alien vegetation with indigenous riparian plants, and then the recreational in infrastructure. So it's how can we make these areas useful to the community so that they're seen more as a, as a, a valuable space. Then there's the river management services. So we've spoken about Sheesters and Velo, but there's other programs. And then I think probably the most, uh, the key one here is the social economic uh, capital. So leadership development uh, within the community and within the city, community education, capacity building, enterprise development, and all of those things that build programs and will support the programs and the, and, and the expansion of the programs. So just moving on some, to examples in the, 82, uh, the 2022 KZN floods, we had uh, extreme floods. But what was exciting, although it wasn't pleasant going through the floods and we lost a number of uh, many lives um, in the floods, is that we started to see if we move on to the next slide, these pictures that we, we took from the air the morning after. And this first picture is, is a picture of a, a culvert. You can see the river coming down. You can see the waste collected there. We move to the next slide. You can actually see the debris that's caught against. As I said, 70% of the blockage is alien and plant vegetation uh, blockage and 30% and is solid waste. And when moving on to the next slide, you can actually see the damage at that road and the services that have been damaged, the, the connectivity within the city that was disrupted and people couldn't get to work, couldn't get their children to school. So all that economic impact that happened as well. So moving on to the next slide, you can see this is a six meter high bridge when the, you can see the debris stuck against it. We go into the next slide. Again, this is a one of the connectors within our city and the debris blocked the culvert and the approaches on either side were washed away. Not to mention the electric cables, the sewers, the, the water mains that crossed that bridge as well. So moving on to the next slide, this is one of our informal settlements in, in the city where the, 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 the bridge blocked and the water jumped out of the river channel and took out, we, we lost nearly 400 dwellings within, within this uh, settlement during the floods. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's impacting all sectors of our community. And if you look at the last picture that uh, you can again see the, the, the vegetation against the bridge and then the solid waste um, upstream of that. So looking at the Seashell and Velo program in the April 22, 22 storm, we asked the consultants to provide us a report of the streams that we were looking after. And it really highlights uh, the powerful, uh, the power of this amazing work. So although there was some damage and we expect this because we're not covering the whole stream yet um, because we are spreading the work within different wards um, and the goal is ultimately to do every, all, all the streams. Um, but there are a few single sentences within this report that say a huge amount and uh, in, um, in the Amlazi areas, we had uh, some areas were fortunate to have minor damage. Uh, certain areas in the south were not massively affected. Areas in Newlands were not massively affected. This just showed evidence of 
The removal of solid waste and alien vegetation out of these streams meant that those culverts didn't block. It meant the water didn't go over and block, uh, damage the roads and services. And so we saw a massive, in those areas, we, we saw a savings in millions of rands that we didn't see in the other areas where we're not managing the, the rivers under similar programs. So for us, this was a concrete evidence of how we can look after, if we look after this ecological infrastructure, we can make our cities more resilient. And we're not having to spend money on replacing damaged infrastructure, but rather maintaining it. So the key learnings that have come out of this program, it's important to identify the, the needs, identify needs linked to department mandates. This starts to bring different departments together into working in the sector and providing budget and resources. Create a platform for cross-sector engagement. Find a champion, find someone within an organization. This is new, new way of doing business. And as with most government sectors, we find that when there's a new idea, you, the existing processes are tested and are stretched. And there's some people that are not keen to do something differently. We've always done it like this is a saying we often get. So why should we change it? And so the key is finding a champion that's going to drive it and, and start proving the benefits. Link the mandates to, and this opens up funding sources. So we start getting funding from different departments because they're seeing that their mandates are being addressed by this cross-sectoral program. The key too is start somewhere. What we've seen is by starting small, creating this evidence, we've got now councillors that are asking for this to be brought out in their ward because they're seeing the benefits. So it creates the momentum. Find funding that captures all the benefits. Uh, so depending on whether you're looking at, at water funds, we're looking at climate change funds, whether you're looking at uh, these different aspects that are, result in benefits out of this program, it helps you to capture these different funds. We've also learned from everyone in every program. We look for opportunities to close those loops, uh, the recycling, the we're looking at those continuously and, and uh, in a number of different, as you bring in the different sectors, people are bringing in different ideas. So engage the internal departments, the academia, NGOs and business, and then keep identifying all the benefits. The more benefits you identify, the more sectors that you bring into this process. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Wow, big round of applause. Jeff Tooley, uh, people never said it was easy working for a city. And what you're doing there, you used the word that I wanted to use in your, in your last slide. You used the word champion. I think what we've heard from Rob, what we've heard and witnessed from you and Rob and from Alejandro so far in this riveting session is that in each case, there is a champion that's dedicated, that's driving this initiative. Whether it is predominantly a pilot that is being researched meticulously, whether it is number crunching to convince a whole lot of people from the society right through to the decision makers and the private sector, uh, and whether it is actually investing, taking a leap of faith into a fund with a variety of, of uh, landowners, role players, et cetera, it, is, it takes a brave, committed person that has a vision. It's called a champion. And there are many water champions here with us in Bonn this week. And I applaud you all for, for the efforts that you are doing. And Jeff, please keep on doing this amazing work. I think it can really take off everywhere in Africa. And I can see other places in the world where it can be equally applicable. So... We've seen a wonderful example from the fund. We've seen the technology from Alejandra. We've seen the practice here in Etiquini. It works. Our last speaker, and please stay on the line, Jeff, uh, because there may be some questions from the floor or comments that you'd like to listen to or respond to. Our last speaker is a lady, Maria Flores, um, who is the Planning and Investments Corporate Manager of the Water and Sanitation Company of Bogota. We're going to another part of the world now. And uh, Maria is, um, uh, um, has got many years of experience uh, convincing 
uh, and, uh, people of the importance to keep contributing to the social policy design and implementation of in Colombia, which has led Maria to her current position. So Maria, a lot of activism from your side, a lot of hard work to get where you are in the position, uh, having to convince people to invest in the work that you do. Please come and share your experience with us. Uh, you are going to um, talk about um, the innovation in nature-based solutions, evaluation and monitoring. Very, very important aspect. And you're gonna showcase the good practices from your initiative in Bogota and Colombia. Please come and take the floor. You're welcome to speak from here. And move your own slides. I'll give you the instructions when you get here. Good morning. Um, so, in this presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce you or like walk you through our process of defining our NBS portfolio. So, this is going to be a bit different of what we have seen, but it's us uh, trying to deep dive into this experience. How do we do it? How do we start off? And this is uh, how was our experience. So, just like a first. Um, comments on our company. So the agenda is going to be the following, a small introduction um, on our company. Then we're going to talk about a nature-based solutions project portfolio. How do we define it? And then we're moving to the e &M framework. And lastly, we're going to talk about or just like sum up with some takeaways. So uh, I think if you were in yesterday's presentation, just like this very same slide, because it's going to be quite crucial for the rest of the presentation, we have three main supply systems. We have the North system, the Chingasa system, which is in the East, uh, and the South system. Chingasa system accounts for around 70% of the water supply we have in the city of Bogota. The North system for around 25% and the remaining or even more and then the remaining is in the South system and in the rest of the systems. But these are the three main systems. We are in the city of Bogota, the capital of Colombia. We also serve uh, another two municipalities neighboring Bogota, um, Soacha and Echancipa, and we sell water to another 11 municipalities. But we do not provide direct service to these other 11 municipalities. Other only direct service in the first three ones, Bogota, Soacha, and Angachancipa. So we serve with these two um, like, uh, models of service uh, more than nine million people. So you can imagine how important it is for us to tackle climate change and the challenges it poses to us because a lot of people rely on us to provide the, the service. Just like we have uh, here, the, the different networks we have, the water supply networks, the storm drain networks, the sanitation, we provide the war, both the water and the sanitation services. Uh, we have been uh, out there for more than 130 years, so we have been acquiring some experience on the field. And um, we have actually more than 99% coverage in water provision and nearly 98% in uh, sanitation provision. But we are still working on improving um, of or boosting our um, treatment capacity. We only treat 30% of the water, but we are in the process of building the, one of the largest uh, wa waste we uh, wastewater treatment plants in Latin America, which is going to be a massive project, uh, the wastewater plant with Canoas. So, uh, as I mentioned, we are not alien to climate, changes, uh, climate change challenges. We, um, according to the um, climate risk assess assessment we conducted in order to comply with our commitments uh, with the Paris Agreement, we realized that uh, between 2011 and 2040, 2040 we're going to have 35% more rainfall um, in the west part of the city. And we are going to have, on the other hand, a reduction in 50% in rainfall in the east part of the city. So what does this mean? This means that we are going to have more flooding risk um, 
in this in the part of the city that is going to be is going to complicate our sanitation and sewage infrastructure management. But on the other side, we are going to have less rainfall in the part of the city where we actually need it, where because it's where we get the water from, which is the Chingasa system that I was showing you before. So uh, this is quite a challenging um, picture we have before us. Um, the company has been working on several, several pillars. One of them is the sustainable modernization. And um, inside this pillar, we're working in increasing our water resilience in Bogota. So what are we doing on this end? We are um, regreening uh, several urban areas with more than 55,000 trees. We're also developing a climate uh, change vulnerability analysis. So we are hiring several consultancies to better help understand, uh, better help us understand what are our challenges in operational terms uh, in face of these challenges I was showing you. And we're also increasing our portfolio of green infrastructure. For these, or thanks to these, we're diving in into the process of um, checking green finance, like uh, green bonds, trying to issue green bonds. But, but as we are going to see later on, monitoring is a crucial um, problem for us. So, and I think it's, it's quite the case for many many companies, operators. So that's one we're trying to tackle. And we are also, and this is very important, we own more than 33,000 uh, 33, hectares, which is around half of the area of Singapore. And we own this in order to protect the water dependent areas. And this is quite a work we have been doing. And what we're going to see is quite of a subset of these areas that we, that we own. What can we do on these areas? Do we need to acquire more areas to protect and ensure the, the water provision in the future? So we start here with how do we define our nature-based portfolio? And um, for this, just like to give you some like um, preliminaries. This was a project that was financed by the IADV. Uh, the Inter American Development Bank, and it was implemented by IDOM Consulting between 2021 and 2023. So it is right out of the oven, the, the results that we're go going to show you. Um, and the idea was to identify which are those NDS that the city can conduct. What can we do? What is most efficient? What is most co cost effective? And uh, when you try to define what is going to, what your NBS portfolio is going to be. The main question, the first question you have to ask yourself, what is your investment goal, yes? Or what is like uh, your investment objective? And what we wanted to do here is like, we want to reduce the, the, the treatment of water cost, the cost uh, that we have to, to, to treat water. That was like our main objective. So in order to reduce our, our treatment cost, we focus on three elements. The, fir the first one was sediment uh, retention, the, se the second one was nutrient remotion, uh, nutrients remotion, and the third one was increasing the flow of water. So these were our three elements that we considered in order to, to analyze the, the different projects or the different uh, options we had. We also talk about two fr uh, time frameworks, a short-term uh, time framework and a long-term one, um, because we realized how hard it was going to be or how ambitious the, the project was going to get, so we tried to set like uh, goals uh, and get a low-hanging fruit in order to not get like disappointed in the process, but just rather um, have more, more impulse and go for the, for the long-term objectives. And this is like the, the main, like the preview. So in order to define what our NBS was going to portfolio was going to be, we use three tools. RIOs, um, multi-criteria scenario analysis, and then the program INVEST. So with RIOs Resource Investment Opportunity System, it's a program developed by Stanford University. And what we do here is to, or this software help us to identify what are, what are, what are those areas that more uh, more biophysical benefit represent for the for the city. So that's the question they they want to they, they want to answer. Where do we focus our efforts based on a biophysical criteria, and what do we do there? Do we do conservation or do we do restoration? Um, with the multi criteria scenario, we try to put in, in into the discussion some other elements like economic, social uh, c uh, constraints that we may face. And then with invest, what we do is um, 
define what is the cost benefit of those initiatives. That's basically how it works. So what were the results then? So when we first applied the, um, the, the Rio's initiative, we defined, we, we decided, or this, I mean, this is the map that results from the, from the Rio's intervention. So on the left, we have the conservation areas, and on the right, we have the restoration areas that were the result from this, in, from this result. When you apply the Rio's um, software, you have to define a restriction, a constraint. So up to what amount of land are you willing or can you intervene? So our percentage was defined in 25%. This is like a para parameter that we are checking to see how, how the moving it is going to change the results, but that's what we did in, the, in this consultancy. And then um, with 25% applied to the 17 catchment areas that we have. So these catchment areas are like around the Chingasa, North and South system. And with the restriction of 25%, this is the result that Rios gives to us. And they say like, okay, uh, you have to basically intervene as much as you, uh, as much as you can in, the, in those 17 catchment areas, but on the left, uh, we have what uh, they consider is best to, cons uh, to implement conservation, and on the right, what's best to implement restoration. Um, and then after we apply the, um, the RIOs, we go to the multi-criteria analysis. So as I mentioned, the idea was to give into the co put in the co into the conversation what were those economic, social constraints that we were facing, legal constraints as well, regulation constraints, and given all those constraints, then they, uh, what we have is another layer of information of, of how uh, likely it is for um, like a plan to be implemented in this area. So in the purple ones we have that is very little likely that we can do something in the short term. And on the green, the green spots are where it's very likely where we can implement um, the, the interventions given the, the restrictions that we face. So of course we focus first on what is very likely to have an impact. Um, when, we, when we run uh, INVEST, which is the third program to see what are the benefits that we're going to get, that, that our first stage is to see how can we reduce or how are like our targets being met. And when we see uh, how, how do we meet our targets with conservation, what we see is that we have a reduction in more than 5,000 kilograms per year in nitrogen. In sediment retention, we have more than 56 uh, tons per year uh, retained. And the base flow increases between conservation and restoration in nearly 160 uh, liters per second, which is like not, uh, an important amount of flow um, by, this, by this end. So after we selected this, or, and we conducted this analysis, we then went to our reality and said, what are the properties that the company is going to buy in the short term? Because we also have, on the, we have another like, plan, con conducting another plan, which is our purchase program plan to accrue more in these 33,000 hectares I was speaking about. So we said, um, we said this is a, these are the properties that we're likely to buy in the future because we have an agreement with the local environmental authority and they, we, we can purchase th those areas for them. So these are like in the list to buy very soon. And in that list, there were 11 properties that were included into the analysis or that had like an um, intersection with the analysis that we just referred to. And after we analyzed these 11 uh, properties, we decided to go with four, we were going to be the pilot. And these four properties, we, um, the consultancy decided that we had to implement these, these strategies, uh, NVS strategies. So in two of those properties, sequential biofilter, in another property, riverbank restoration, and in the last one, improved ecotone. So these are the, um, uh, specifically the NBS that we were going to implement in these four areas for piloting. We haven't implemented them. As you see, just saw, we had the results of the consultancy just uh, this year. So that's the work we have to uh, perform from now onwards. A very important part after we have done the selection and defined the portfolio um, that also helps us to monitor and see, I mean, how, how willing this is going to happen, is to implement an evaluation and monitoring framework. 
So the ENM framework uh, consists of three elements, e impact assessment, economic evaluation, and environmental monitoring. So with the impact assessment, what we want to do is to know what is the magnitude of the change I'm going to, to have given these initiatives, what is the sensitivity, am I having byproducts, negative byproducts that I may be neglecting in the first analysis, I need to consider them in order to, uh, to subtract them from the positive impact I'm expecting. And then the significance, not only can be big, but it is a statistically significant. Does it make sense to implement it from like a statistic point of view? And what we have here is, I mean, this is, the, the table is quite tight, but basically the message here is we need to assess one of these, each one of these um, dimensions. And what we do is, for instance, in the Chingasa system, which is our largest system, we have the sediments in water bodies as an environmental aspect. We define then the, um, the source of the impact. In this case, is affectation of the physicochemical properties of the water. Then we decide whether this impact is direct or indirect. And then we try to define how is the baseline scenario and then how is the scenario with the project. Is this feature going to be impacted significantly with the project or not? So we have this table, as you can imagine, the with project pro uh, a scenario is like an initial assessment because we haven't performed the, the project uh, still. But what we see here is that there are some problems, for instance, the severe one in the without project. We have some problems with loss of vegetation without the program, and we expect the program to have an important, a severe, but in this case, severe is a good word, uh, impact in the increase of biodiversity, for instance. So that's how you read these tables. So this was analysis we conduct to um, analyze the impact that we, each one of these NBS was going to have. We did the same for the north system, for the south system. One important thing to bear in mind is that despite the Shingaza system represents more than 70% of the water supply of the city, we, for the sake of the analysis, we consider them both, uh, all three systems, uh, equally important because even though one of them provides less uh, supply to less people, we need that to happen because we somehow lack some uh, interconnectivity in the system. So we need all these three systems to be working efficiently. So then we move to the economic evaluation, which is the second part of the ENM framework. And with the economic evaluation, we need to compare the capex invest that, that is the investment with the ecological service we're going to expect. So we needed to translate these benefits into numbers to be able to compare them to the investment we had to undertake. And when we do this, oh, or my, I mean better, to do this, we need to establish a, co a causal change. So. Uh, we need to define kind of proxies for each one of the steps so we can uh, accurately me measure them. So what we expect is the NBS investments to have an impact on uh, the quality and the quantity of water and that quality and quantity of water to have an impact as well in the cost of treating water. So our proxies to for this, each one of these elements of this change, for the NBS investments, what we tried to measure was the amount of solids suspended. For the changes in water quantity, we tried to take as proxy the turbidity observed. And then in the changes in the costs of treatment, what we, do, what we did, one of, I mean, we measured several treats. One of them was to analyze the relative sludge that we had to, at the end of the process, because we have disposal costs and with less sludge, we have le less disposal costs. So these are the, um, the results that we got from that analysis. And what we see is that for the south system, which is the gray bar, we have uh, an important impact specifically in the reduced sludge production. That's massive, but it's also the chemical products required for treatment was going to be also an important impact in the south system. For the north, the north system, the, um, also reduced sludge production was important. And for Chingaza, uh, the savings that come from uh, from the less water was going to use to clean the filters was like the main uh, saving. So these four features were the ones that were analyzing this last step of the chain I was showing you. So we have reduced sludge production, water savings from filter cleaning, and chemical product saving. We also have a fourth dimension there, which is income from additional treated water. But that's, uh, I mean, that's, that was not the one that we look at, mo at the most. The three ones uh, in the lower part 
for the ones that we consider more, more specifically. So when we try to um, estimate the benefits, once we estimate the benefits and we have the investments that we have to undertake in order to, to perform this MBS, what we have is a, a positive net present value for the North system, and uh, which is also reflected in the return on investment. So as you see, Chingaza has an 8% uh, return on investment rate, um, but it has a negative uh, present value. And the reason is that for us, according to the National Planning Department, um, the minimum return on investment rate we can accept is 9%, which is, and actually the opportunity cost that the company has according to a, a um, regulation standard is 12.28% in real terms. Whatever the that is less than that is complicated to, to defend, so to speak. Mm. So does this mean that we should only implement the NBS in the North system? Not necessarily. What, we, what this can be telling us is that we need to explore more alternatives, and we need to explore more benefits. As I mentioned, we, just we were only exploring the benefits in these three, in these three or four dimensions, but we also can like, analyze, for instance, the, uh, the impact on camber, uh, carbon sequestered and so many other um, environmental um, variables that we are neglecting in this analysis. So we need to go farther because for sure we're going to find more um, positive impacts that we are considering right now, and we may have a return investment, posit a positive return investment um, in the future. I mean, for future analysis. So these are some of the variables that we need to consider, or we think we can consider for more, um, for more um, information. And just like one last message is, is very important, and that's the last part of the ENM framework is to monitor. We need to be able to introduce the possibility of remote, remote monitoring. It's very hard to measure the benefits um, when, we have, when we face financial constraints to have a good monitoring system. And sometimes, like having this remote monitoring can be more, can make the program more feasible, yes? Um, and this is something we have, we are like uh, advocating for we need to be able to really measure the benefits of the ENBS because that's the way we can sell it to several stakeholders. Uh, we understand the environmental benefits, we know it's good, but not all the people think in environmental terms. So we need to translate environmental benefits into numbers uh, to make other people be on board of our projects. And that's something we have learned in the company. We need to make, we, have, we need the environmental uh, manager to be on board, but also we need the investment manager and we need the finance manager on the project. And we can address the same problem, but with different arguments, and that's something we need to, to learn to do better. So besides that, i just like to mention that we can also have potential benefits in reduction of utilities, because if we have lower treatment uh, costs, we can translate that into our, to our customers uh, by lower tariffs. And we also are exploring right now in the CT the possibility of introducing these uh, investments um, in tariffs. So it's a bit counterintuitive because we're reducing uh, treatment costs and we reduce tariff on that. But also many of these um, investments are not performed because the companies don't have the resources to implement them. So on the other hand, the solution is that we can be, that the regulation is enabling us slowly to be able to introduce these uh, investments on the tariff. So we have a win-win situation. We still need to assess what is the net impact on the tariff that the users are going to, to assume, but that's one like uh, important advance we're having. And I think I will end up with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And another word that we can that we can attribute to these champions is tenacity and absolutely seeing it through. Uh, so if you need to show more benefit, benefits, show more benefits. Uh, we probably will learn a lot in the years ahead about the multiple environmental benefits in working with nature. We know water is nature, but water management and uh, looking uh, uh, into the water system requires us to rethink our relationship with nature. And that's not easy. Nobody said it was going to be easy, but in fact, it is so necessary for our relationship with nature ultimately and for our sustainability in our urban context, uh, for water supply and also for wastewater management. So um, 
I thank all the speakers for fantastic, very, very diverse, but fantastic examples of what's possible. Uh, we know that it comes with a lot of hard work, and we congratulate you for doing that. I hope everybody here has taken some, a lot of, of messages home with you. Um, I do know that we're eating into your lunchtime, no pun intended, but I do want to open the floor very quickly. If there is one or two pressing questions, you can also, of course, talk to our two speakers here in the room over lunch. But if there's any comment or any question from the floor, please. Yes, sir, I see your hand raised. Just please put your mic on and yeah. speak. Uh, good morning, uh, Milo from uh, the European Association of Public Water Operators. Um, question to Ms. Flores. Uh, well, congratulations on a very extraordinary, inspiring presentation. I think that a lot of European utilities would have to learn from your approach methodology. A really lot of food for thoughts. Uh, a couple of quick questions. You mentioned at uh, a certain point um, also uh, some regulatory and legal uh, barriers, especially regarding land acquisition. If you can say a little bit more about kind of constraints or barriers that you have on this point of view. Second question, uh, regarding the methodology for monitoring and assessing. Uh, is that something that you developed internally and in your utility or has been developed together with other, uh, I mean, external consultants or based on some guidance? Uh, and to which extent this methodology can be shared? Uh, I mean, which is not proprietary. Uh, and then I uh, also have a little personal question in the sense to you said that about the importance of translating environmental benefit, uh, so to monetize environmental benefit and to make them trans uh, readable and understandable from economic point of view to those, to, to those that cannot understand uh, the environmental uh, benefit of something, some of the things that you are doing. Uh, your personal view, to which extent this can be done? I mean, to which extent we can really monetize environmental benefit or giving them an economic value because there are maybe some limits to do, methodological limits to doing so. Thank you. Just before you answer, Maria, let's see if there's one or two more questions, and then we'll take that round of questions and conclude the session. It, all comments to any of the speakers. Madam, I see your hand raised, please. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentations. My name is Mary from Kenya, Kakamega Water. Um, we are in the initial stage of starting a water fund in my company. We call it uh, the Yala Water Fund. And I'm seeing a lot of hope. Uh, we shall be following you uh, maybe online so that uh, we can also gain into the successes I've seen. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. And I know that there are Africa Water Funds as well, so maybe Rob can quickly respond to that as well. Is there a third remark or question anybody would like to make? Do not see any hands. So let us quickly get a response, Maria, from you, and then Rob from you as well. And if the, our two online speakers want to say anything in conclusion, you can do so as well before that we end the session. Thank you for your question. Um, as to the first one on the regulations constraints we're facing, um, we have to say that just recently, or rather recently, the regulator um, issued um, a, a resolution that allows us as operators to introduce environmental investments into the tariff. This, this happened in late 2019, and, but it's, it has seldom been applied because we still don't understand what counts as environmental investment. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, they just uh, gave like a reintroduction of the, to the resolution. Um, so yes, we have like the tools right now. They have been rather recent tools in 2019, but we are still need to understand them better. So, but that's, that was the main constraint, like not being able to introduce environmental investments into the tariff, because then how do we get the resources? And they're very, very expensive. Uh, on the second one, monitoring, we do not have the monitor system right now. And that's kind of the bottlenecks we have, and one of the ones we expect to develop soon. And I have to say here on other end, but related to also like green discussions, is that we were planning to issue green bonds, for instance, and we that was our target for this year. But unfortunately, we see that not happening uh, this time anytime soon because 
one of our biggest constraints was, was to be able to monitor all the indicators that they request us for us to, to issue these bonds. Um, so what we are doing now is calling different institutions, consultancies, to see how can we do that better. Because there's a lot of reporting to do. We understand that's necessary. But we, right now, don't have the, the muscle, the monitoring muscle to do so. We think that when we do uh, take the steps uh, required for that, we will appeal to remote monitoring because um, if we're going to do it, let's do it like well right away. That's what we, we think, and it's going to be easier. And on the personal, uh, the last question, like from a personal standpoint, is it possible to translate everything into benefits? Like something, I, I think we have to try. <laughs> we have to try because um, somebody mentioned the movie last uh, yesterday's session, like Don't Look Up. And I think, unfortunately, this is something we have, we, we need to try harder on showing people the problems that we are facing. Um, and I think many of them, most of us maybe, may not realize them, uh, but maybe we can help them to try to translate this into numbers. We are like moving towards that direction. This consultancy is going, the results are going to be published uh, by the a a IADV, and also we locally we're going to publish them in the Andesco, which is the National Utility um, um, like confederation, um, but yes, we need to to try. It's not easy, but we need to try. And certainly, more the, the more often we have more tools that we can imagine, and we can find creative ways to translate these benefits into numbers. Thank you, Maria. Um, Rob, let's speak into this microphone because then our online speakers can also hear you. And then, Rob, any concluding remarks before we move over to Alejandro and Jeff to close us out? Uh, just very quickly on the valuation, environmental valuation piece, I think one of the key things to remember is what you're doing the valuation for. So um, are you trying to create a new revenue stream, in which case there's a kind of element of um, who are you trying to convince to invest in that program, or are you trying to create an overall benefit so that you can make choices between different, in, you know, different, um, yeah, like a va the least cost versus best value, and what is the best value? And the key learning from the UK at the moment is that you can do brilliant kind of valuation studies, but affordability will always be your cap. And therefore, you might not, you might be able to prove that there are wider environmental benefits. But unless you can, if, if you can't monetize those and draw investment in against them, affordability will be your, be your enemy. And just very quickly on African, on the Africa kind of water fund movement, um, the Europe is very, very early in the stages in terms of the water fund model. And um, so I'm looking, uh, I'm looking to learn from Africa. So yeah, let's have a conversation about that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. Alejandro, can we go to you for any quick concluding remarks and take out messages and then to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, I just wish to, I just wanted to thank you Thank everyone here for your attention, for your time, and for keep working for the water and for the nature-based solutions, because really it's the, um, the best way I have encountered to, to work with rural communities. So keep, up, keep the hard work going, and I hope to see you soon. And the same to you. I think the research that you're doing, the pioneering work that you're doing there can be replicated in many places. So please do keep up the hard work and share what comes out of your study with all of us. Thank you very much for your participation. Jeff, I believe the last word is for you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone, for the time and opportunity to share, but also some of the exciting things that we've heard shared from the other speakers. It's, we always learn at these, uh, everybody adds value to this. And I'm excited about uh, how we can share and the more effort that's put into uh, improving our eco e ecological infrastructure and the learnings that we have at how, if we do that, we can have a more positive impact and make our cities more resilient. So thanks very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, all the speakers. And thank you also to all the water champions in the room with us today. And I believe now you deserve your lunch. Thank you.